Welcome everyone to uh, CG seminar number 291 and good to see everyone coming in as we op as Trevor opens up the webinar. Today our topic is higher education in Russia and of course that takes on an added edge doesn't it in the context of the war in Ukraine but Russia is one of the most important and largest higher education systems in the world and indeed science systems as well. And uh, the potential of the war to affect higher education in Russia and the relationships between Russia and the rest of the world is, has been much discussed in recent weeks. CG is approaching this by running two webinars on higher education in Russia. The first one, today's webinar, will look at the history, the recent, the modern history of Russian higher education from the late Soviet period until now, and will give us a sense of, of where things have come from, where they're going. And our second webinar in late June, will look at the situation since the war began, the situation not only in terms of Russia's relationship with the rest of the world, but also the situation inside Russian higher education system and institutions. To lead us today, we have a very distinguished group, uh, and in particular, our, our lead presenter, Isaac Fryman. Now, Isaac is the... Uh, is a fellow of the International Academy of Education, and he's been head of the Institute of Education at the National Research University High School of Economics, one of the most internationalized Russian institutions, well known to many, I'm sure. He's been an advisor to the Minister for Education and Science previously, and pr prior to joining HSC, he was a lead education specialist at the World Bank. Um, as well as ESAC, we have with us two uh, panelists who will act as discussants after ESAC gives his primary uh, address. The first is Phil Altback, who again will be known to many, um, the research professor and distinguished fellow at the Center for International Higher Education at Boston College, I think the most cited scholar in relation to higher education studies in the world. Uh, and I'm sure almost everyone who's looking at today's um, webinar will have at some point read one of, at least one of Phil's works and probably many more. And our second discussant, also very well known to all of you, is Ellen Hazelcorn, the expert on global rankings and who's a member of the CG Research Management Committee and Advisory Board and one of our project researchers amongst her many other, the many other hats that she wears. Um, now, before I, I bring in Isaac, uh, uh, I'll just remind you of the webinar protocols. Now, remember that the webinar is being recorded uh, and will be posted online on the CG website soon, uh, usually within 24 hours. Uh, and then, then it, of course, um, is, is accessible on YouTube um, in our YouTube channel. A transcript of the chat function from today will also be posted on our website. Now, during the webinar, keep yourself muted unless you've been asked to speak or ask a question. Uh, and there's no need to have your video on either. We recommend using speaker view in the top right hand corner there so you can more clearly see who is talking at any point in the webinar. Now to ask a question or make a statement during the Q&A section, we recommend that you use the chat function. That's how we, met, if we can identify people who are interested in coming into the Q&A conversation. And at the end of the presentation section and the discussant responses, uh, we'll then compose the Q&A. If your question is selected, I'll send you a warning in the, um, in the uh, chat on the private line and, um, at, and then I'll invite you in. At that point, if you're invited into the discussion, don't forget to unmute yourself, turn on, let your sound work and switch on your video and state your name and where you were from. At this point, it's a delight to hand over to Isaac. Floor is yours, Isaac. Dear Simon, uh, dear colleagues, it's, it's a great pleasure for me to be with you today and thanks for the initiative to run this seminar. You know, uh, Benedict Spinoza said once, don't cry, don't laugh, try to understand. And that's a good recipe in these difficult times. Uh, I personally was very emotional about what's going on. I have personal links with Ukraine. I was born in Ukraine. 
and I'm patriot of Russia and the Russian culture. And this uh, recently, yesterday we celebrated Victory Day, and I visited my. Uh, I had a conversation uh, over through Zoom with my uncle, who is ninety. Seven, and he was 17 years old when he joined Soviet army that fought with Nazis. And he's big patriot of Russia. He spent 30 years in Russian military, and he said, "It's really difficult to understand how grandsons of comrades of those who fought together against Hitler now fight with each other." So it's again, this is very emotional situation, but uh, thanks to this opportunity, uh, it put me to think about what's going on and what higher education, uh, what is the relation of higher education to this situation. So uh, I guess it's a great idea to have two seminars. We would be uh, waiting for the seminar on, uh, um, uh, 20, June 23, and I hope I will lay down with Phil and Ellen some ground for the further discussion. Uh, next slide, please. In fact, uh, there was a good uh, literature, there is a good literature on the transformation, post-Soviet transformation on Russian education and other post-Soviet countries. Uh, you have the list of main uh, books, in my opinion, but there are more. Uh, the team from high, uh, from Institute of Education or HSC works on that issues to try to understand uh, better initial conditions of the transformation and the driving forces. Uh, so let's start from the initial conditions. Uh, next slide, please. This is one of my uh, favorite uh, pictures. Uh, which says uh, about uh, Soviet studentship. Comrades move ahead towards the top of knowledge mountain for our people, proud being of us. So the idea, uh, in, often my colleagues consider Soviet or socialist higher education as something backward or underdeveloped. I argue that it was a particular model of higher education. In fact, the model that was uh, predicted not only by Lenin and Karl Marx, but by Robert Owen, Henri Saint-Simon, uh, and Jean Fourier. So the idea to have higher education that contribute to the, uh, into the development of people, development of nation. There are two main distinguished features of Soviet model, and they are still, in fact, when you look at Chinese higher education, uh, I agree with Simon that in particular, it, it has Confucian legacy, but it also has Marxian legacy. Next slide, please. And there are two uh, distinguished features, as I mentioned. First, it's, it's a quasi-corporate uh, higher education system. Uh, as Vladimir Lenin said, higher education should be part of single factory. In his opinion, uh, higher education should be a manpower production machine, which, put, which puts a person uh, into the right place. Again, like socialist and ut utopian socialists predicted. Uh, to plan for the person the best trajectory, to put him or her into the job place, to have very specialized training, to move research out of this manpower production machine and being highly centralized, to be, uh, to operate within this single tech. But we often underestimate the second important feature of socialist system. It's social engineering and it's human engineering system where moral, social and ideological training should be an important part. Uh, Soviet uh, Bolsheviks were not uh, really the first who invented that. 
uh, Jesuit colleges uh, uh, were famous in Middle Ages in uh, by being formative. Uh, but uh, uh, I would argue that as a public system, socialist Soviet system was the first that practiced uh, this moral engineering, social engineering in, in a big scale. What's also important about higher education system in Russia, there is a great book by Terry Martin from Harvard, Affirmative Action Empire. It was a system with very restrictive, restrictive access. There was an idea that no more than 10% of the age cohort should be in higher education. But it, com it, it was combined with affirmative actions, especially aimed into gender equality and ethnic equality. Russification that came within the part of this higher education agenda was not just imperialist. Yeah, we could consider that as a colonialism, but it was a part of modernization agenda. Moreover, uh, Soviet higher education had an idea to build international community of socialist youth. So these are initial conditions. Then we have to think about the forces that started to shape so former Soviet education in Russia after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Next slide, please. Um, I, in, in, in my previous work and in previous work on many of my colleagues, I and frameworks to understand the competing forces that influence higher education development in post-Soviet settings. And I have to stress that I change this framework now because um, uh, I almost sure that our previous idea that part of this uh, uh, force was the so-called policy border was not correct. It was not policy border. I would call it pragmatic modernization. Because we can consider that as westernization, but it was pragmatic uh, thing to develop more effective system. But probably one of the most uh, interesting forces behind the development, post-Soviet development, was um, the expansion. As uh, Simon and um, uh, other colleagues in their great book on high participation system mentioned, demand expansion is the change and is, it's also a driving force. So it's important to understand that um, in many aspects, uh, the services in Soviet Union were, was were very restricted. The, the access was restricted. It was a public service, but uh, if the Central Committee of Communist Party said that it should be 10%, it was 10%. And if you are from 11%, you couldn't enter the university. So demand for expanding access was very powerful uh, driving force behind the change. But we also shouldn't overlook two other important changes. And I have to tell you that I think that I personally didn't pay enough attention to them. Uh, one of them is nation building. In fact, I looked uh, in my studies of post-Soviet higher education, I thought about that when I looked to other post-Soviet countries, because many of these countries didn't have their statehood before the collapse of the Soviet Union. So the higher education systems in these countries played important role in building nation state. But Russia was also one of the republics. And Russia also had, as still has, the important task to find its identity as a new state. And obviously one of the um, uh, ambitions of the Russian states is to become a global leader. You can, you can call it empire, but uh, it's, a it's an idea of global leadership. So this force, the demand, the desire of the state to become one of the global players, global leaders, had a profound and 
has now profound impact on the higher education system. And what's also interesting, the further development of the Soviet model. Soviet model, uh, the um, people who still believe in Soviet model, they were not just uh, uh, struggling, they were not fighting against Westernization or new development. They tried to promote these two distinctive features of Soviet model that I mentioned already. The strong links between higher education and industry and economics and um, uh, human engineering. In fact, uh, I just, uh, it came to my mind when John Dewey, 100 years ago, visited Soviet Union. He said that this is the first time, he said in my life, when I see such uh, linkages between, high, between education and society. So the proponent of Soviet model didn't uh, just observe and criticize Westernization. They continued to promote the idea of linkages between economics and higher education and the idea of human engineering and social engineering. So different layers of this of huge system, as Simon mentioned, the higher education system in Russia is more than thousand universities, obviously responded differently to different drivers. So let's see what happened with all each of these forces. Next slide, please. Uh, I have a slide on periods of transformation. I don't think that we have time to discuss it. So those who are interested can look now into that. Um, uh, in fact, my periodization uh, is based on the idea that different driving forces played different role in different periods. So you can indicate them. But let's talk a bit about each driving force. Next slide, please. And the next slide, please. Next. Yeah. So demand for the expansion. Uh, again, before 1992, there was really one major stakeholder. It was a state. What happened when the government opened system up for uh, expectations of the family? It's permitted public institutions, institutions to enroll fee paying students. It's allowed open and private higher education institutions. It increased universities autonomy to satisfy the growing demand and even introduced the new language of students as, as customers. Before that, only the state was a customer. So uh, in one decade, in fact, in, in, in a few years, Russian higher education system became, uh, in Simon's terminology, high participation system. Let's look at the next slide. You see that still, you see from 1999, to 2020, two thirds of Russian families think that higher education is a key for their life success. It's remarkably how flat this curve is. And uh, the system responded to this expectation. Next slide, please. The number of universities, you see the explosion in number of universities. When private universities opened, uh, up and um, branch universities also uh, appeared uh, uh, in the picture. Uh, uh, you can, uh, unfortunately, next slide, uh, it's, it's a separate discussion what happened with the private higher education system, but uh, it really didn't become a major uh, player. Uh, but uh, still, they uh, they play an important role in absorbing the demand. Uh, and uh, currently, uh, let's look at the enrollment rate. Next slide, please. You see that the enrollment rate grew from 14 in 1991. Uh, I mean, enrollment rate in the particular age cohort to one third of the age cohort. But uh, Russia has one of the most developed systems of uh, uh, part-time education in the world, part-time higher education in the world. 
which allow more and more people to enter higher education after the uh, traditional age limit. Uh, so uh, uh, currently Russia, uh, in terms of tertiary education uh, attainment, uh, definitely is among five leading countries in the world. Um, the interesting question that our institute started to study recently, uh, did, next slide please, did this expansion lead to greater equality of educational opportunity? On the one hand, no. We see that elite universities remain extremely unequal, but we cannot neglect the fact that general access has arisen and we have um, very limited data, but very interesting uh, because it goes back to 1963. And we see that the share of kids uh, uh, from families of workers and peasants uh, from in 50 years grew twofold. So yes, the expansion led to greater equality of education. Not as much as we wanted, and it, uh, it, it, it is a big problem in Russia, but still it's a high participation system. Let's then move to the second force. It, uh, next slide, please. Uh, pragmatic globalization or pragmatic westernization. Uh, again, I would argue that Russia was quite reluctant to uh, use, let's say, Western model just because they're Western. Uh, I, I'm a witness of this period and I know very pragmatic approach of Russian policy making. They just wanted to have a education system that really adopted not to socialist economy, but to market economy and liberal democracy as Russia was in uh, early 90s. So next slide. And so there were a number of, uh, uh, I would say, pragmatic reform, uh, especially between 2000 and 2010. National entrance exam, uh, which is hated by two thirds of the Russian population for different reason, reasons, uh, but it's still in operation. Bologna process, Russia joined Bologna, officially, uh, Bologna process officially in 2009 and implemented it very well. Doctoral education reform, I, I, uh, it's, it's a funny story because I would call it uh, cargo cult uh, doctoral education reform because uh, there were changes, uh, there were very superficial changes, uh, not enough resources, but still. Also, research mission returned to universities. It, it was pragmatic decision. Even despite uh, the uh, opposition from Russian Academy of Sciences. Let's look at some data uh, to confirm what I said. Next slide, please. So. In this slide, you can see that uh, from 2013 to 2020, the share of master students increased significantly among the Russian students. But you also see that the share of the so-called traditional specialist training is relatively low, uh, despite huge opposition to that, and uh, even. Uh, one of the leading figures in the Russian education, um, rector of Moscow State University and chairman of the Russian Union of University Rectors, Viktor Sadonici, he, uh, he is against Bologna process, he is against two degree system, but it didn't help uh, uh, the uh, traditional system to survive because pragmatically two-tier system is more flexible and suitable for new economy. The next slide, please. Uh, another important influence 
uh, a part again. We can call it neoliberal reform, the vertical stratification. But it was it happened not because it was neoliberal, because uh, Russian policymakers uh, uh, understood that uh, the vertical stratification, particularly, is useful for to achieve their uh, their objectives. And starting from 2006, Russia implemented a number of initiatives to create a lead sector of higher education. And despite quite big opposition to global ranking, for example, uh, in 2021, we, uh, the new project, Priority 2030, was launched. And this project is very much, again, is again, excellence initiative where Russian government is trying to introduce competitive mechanisms to build a lead sector of higher education. And uh, the last slide in this uh, part is, uh, next slide please, uh, just to confirm my point that uh, the growing role of higher education in research. You can see the uh, share of higher education uh, in uh, number of Russian publication in Web of Science Journal. From 1995, uh, it's also grew twofold to 2019. So, um, uh, uh, however, again, uh, next slide, the, the, the last slide in, in this part would be about uh, doctoral education. I promised to tell you uh, about that. That's an interesting point. Uh, the regulatory framework for the doctoral education, uh, for new doctoral education, the movement from traditional German type apprenticeship uh, doctoral education to the so-called structural or taught programs, like uh, let's say we, we call it Anglo-American model. This trans, uh, the regulatory framework for this transition was developed, was introduced, but, and in fact, I guess a few months ago, uh, in the end of 2021, uh, the counter reform happened. And the counter reform happened because the uh, modernization reform didn't give any results. You can see that the share of students, share of uh, doctoral uh, graduates who really defended the thesis is still extremely low and even becoming low. So what happened? We did study this issue and we found that um, the minor detail was missed, uh, sufficient resources. So we call it cargo count. You can use new names, you can use, you can even introduce new uh, legislation but if you don't allow, if you don't allocate resources for real reform, this modernization agenda could become really risky. And uh, uh, in fact, works again, uh, becoming counterproductive. Let's move to a new topic that I didn't think before about. Next slide, please. It's the role of higher education in international position. Uh, we, we discussed that, in fact, many times, and I'm sure Phil uh, and Ellen will add to that. Uh, but uh, I want to stress that, um, yeah, and there, there was an interesting conference, Universities and New Nationalism at Berkeley a few years ago, where we discussed that in some cases, the so-called excellence initiatives are not about the excellence. They are about global positioning. And my friend from Hong Kong, from University of Hong Kong, Anatoly Oleksienka published um, a couple of years ago in 2018, a book with interesting title, International Status Anxiety in Russia and China in Higher Education. And that's about, it. Uh, let's look at, at the next slide. Uh, so how higher education can uh, contribute 
uh, to this desire of Russia to become globally in different areas, to have strong soft power, et cetera, et cetera. It's global positioning, including ranking. It's um, internationalization, uh, not to get money, but to get uh, stronger influence. International researchers also for the same reasons. So let's see uh, what happened in higher education in this area. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the most well-known initiative is Russian Excellence Initiative or five in 100 initiative uh, that was announced by President Putin in 2012. But it's, it's interesting, we call it Excellence Initiative, but the Russian name is Competitiveness Initiative. It's not about just achieving excellence, it's about becoming competitive. So, uh, and this is why international rankings play important role. Otherwise, how would you know that you become globally competitive? And in fact, Russia did quite well with that. Uh, let's see, next slide. Uh, you see that um, in five or six year, the number of universities in top 100 of international ranking, uh, subject ranking grew from three to 11. And number of positions in uh, top 100 in this major international ranking grew from eight to 38. My university uh, was not part of any top 100 in 2013. And in 2020, I'm, I'm very proud that even in the field of education, higher school of economics entered top 100. I, I know uh, all criticism about that, but again, for the global competitiveness and global positioning, it's an important thing. Next slide, please. Uh, another th uh, uh, thing uh, that Russian government uh, put a lot of effort is uh, export of education. The number of international students grew twofold in 10 years. Isn't it impressive? And part of that is because the government uh, increased the so-called government quota for government scholarships for international students four times. Uh, so, there was quite strong influence on that. And especially if you are talking about post-Soviet space. And in this case, we could interpret this process as attempt of Russian higher education to restore position of Russia as a center of at least this big region. Next slide, please. Because 70% of this international students came from post-Soviet countries and the growth is very impressive in growth in 10 years. Um, the, uh, the presentation will be available after the seminar so you can look at that. Uh, I, in many cases, I didn't put sources, uh, unfortunately, but I'm sorry. Uh, uh, the next slide, uh, please, is also very interesting, thanks to Maya Cengseliani, who studied this question, international branch campuses in post-Soviet countries. She did very careful uh, uh, analysis, and we see that what country has more or most campuses in post-Soviet countries? It will be Russia. In fact, even in 2014, we discussed ideas about opening HSC campus in Odessa. So it was quite interesting uh, development at that, uh, at that time, and it, it continued. So the last force that I wanted to discuss and we move to the end of the presentation is the attempt to restore and further develop Soviet model. Uh, next slide, please. And the next slide, please. Uh, 
again, I, as I mentioned, uh, the uh, links between economics and higher education, industry and higher education, uh, were very important part of the Soviet model. And the government really promoted uh, in, through many actions, more active involvement of companies, including private companies, into higher education. Uh, there was a big project where government matched funding with private companies for research and development. But also, uh, uh, almost every Russian university has quite a, a few laboratories or departments built together with the companies. Next slide, please. Also, uh, uh, employability uh, in a new context. There are still many people who want to restore directly mandatory job placement for the university graduates. It, it's, it's not going to work, but we don't study really the attempts of the Russian government to introduce the so-called targeted enrollment. So if you have an agreement with the enterprise, and it could be private enterprise, that after your education, you are going to work there for three years, uh, we, um, uh, so this student can enter earlier, uh, can enter the university with the low grades, which uh, could be very uh, attractive for many students. In medical institutes, more than 70% of students are getting in through targeted enrollment. And uh, the next slide, please. Just a second. Sorry. Uh, uh, the moral and civic or patriotic education. A again, uh, we kind of overlooked the moment when almost each Russian universities uh, established a position of vice rector, special vice rector, in charge of Vospitania, it's a particular Russian term, means moral, civic, or social education. There are numerous government programs and funding to support broad extracurricular engagement. Uh, there are attempts to establish nationwide student organizations, and it's not a secret, there are attempts to control students' political Political activities. So um, there are many. Uh, uh, next slide, please. There are many conflicts now, especially now, and maybe in June seminar uh, we can discuss it more about the tradition and pragmatic westernization. Uh, it, uh, for example, it's about national exam, as I mentioned. It's about mandatory job placement. It's about university uh, autonomy because there are some ideas that there should be state control over curriculum, in, in, uh, at least in some subjects. Um, but let me move to the last slide with some preliminary conclusions. So I think, again, and I fully agree with Simon that uh, these 30 years were, uh, it was a period of strong development of higher education in Russia. And we see very positive results, including research, including uh, access, including internationalization. At the same time, there is, and in a, uh, there are inevitable conflicts uh, between pragmatic modernization, new nationalism and tradition. We also have to learn, and it's not just for Russia, that modernization, which is based uh, only on slogans and regulators is not going to work and could become really uh, fruitless and maybe even poisonous. Poisoning. And the, I think, and I have to think more and uh, investigate 
more the question about expansion without fo a focus on exploring because it could create public distrust and it could really mitigate the role of higher education in social development thank you very much for your attention and for the chance to talk and thank you, Isaac. A monumental achievement to get through those 32 slides so economically and inform us so fully and well. Can I ask uh, Phil Altbeck now to come in as the first discussant? Um, thank you very much. Uh, I, uh, I will limit myself to just a few comments, general comments, uh, um, in part related to uh, Isaac's uh, really uh, uh, excellent uh, dis background discussion of what's happened in the last 30 years uh, in Russia. And in part, I think, maybe relating more to, to the next Russia seminar than this one. Um, uh, I should point out, I am not at all a Russia expert. Um, uh, I happen to be a member of the 5100 Commission uh, appointed by the Russian prime minister uh, and served on it for its entire uh, uh, period and learned a lot, I think, a little bit from the inside uh, about Russian universities and was overall quite impressed with the commitment of almost all, I can't say all, uh, of, the, of the universities that were selected as part of 5100. And I also served on the uh, Higher School of Economics uh, International Advisory Board uh, for a number of years. Uh, interestingly enough, my um, membership in both of those committees uh, ended prior to the recent unpleasantness, uh, which makes me very happy since I did not have to resign uh, as a result. Um, uh, a few comments. I think uh, Isaac maybe underestimated a little bit the role of the Russian Academy of Science uh, in the um, uh, in the research um, focus um, in, in in Russia. And I know again from the um, uh, 5100 um, Commission that there was during the entire period a kind of a struggle, quiet struggle, uh, sometimes not so quiet, between the RAS um, bureaucracy and the universities. Uh, as the universities um, wanted and were asked by 5100 to take on in, uh, you know, the key um, research mission, uh, and the RAS unsurprisingly fought that uh, at, every, uh, at every level, and were partly successful in that struggle. So I think that's an interesting um, something to discuss and sort of consider going forward. Um, here's just a couple of comments in my couple minutes left. Um, uh, broadly, some of them relating to Isaac's uh, presentation and some of them not. We need to remember in the Soviet period that there were some excellent Russian universities. Um, and a lot of really sort of world-class science being done. We also need to remember that um, the, the, the Soviet universities were behind the big wall called the Iron Curtain, uh, and there was relatively little collaboration, even communication between uh, Soviet universities and the other universities in the Soviet system uh, in Eastern Europe and so on. Um, that had much of a contact with the outside world. And of course that I think significantly weakened them in the long run. But it's important to consider that this was a very well-developed system for a long time uh, with the characteristics which uh, Isaac uh, uh, persuasively uh, pointed out. Uh, in the future, I think as a result of the Ukraine uh, war, um, the, there will be very few international faculty in the in the Russian system going forward. And that was a very big emphasis of 5100 and in general of the kind of quote modernization unquote of, uh, uh, of, of the Russian system. And some Russian universities like the Higher School of Economics were quite successful in recruiting international faculty of high quality uh, to 
uh, to, to, to work in Russia. And I think that's uh, at an end um, for a long time. Uh, I think uh, Isaac did not mention this, but in the immediate post-Soviet period when before the universities got back on their feet, uh, they were starved for money. They had no particular, you know, uh, they didn't have a clear mission at the time. Uh, and there was a very big exodus of uh, many top scholars uh, from uh, Russia uh, in, in those days, uh, most of whom, a few of whom came back, most of them did not. And I think we're, we're now seeing another uh, aspect of that exodus, and it's going to be really pretty significant for um, for uh, Russian universities going going forward. And I think that's going to be uh, quite a big uh, problem. And and finally, I think Russia can forget about global positioning at least for a while. Um, that you know, R Rus Russian universities, unfortunately, in some ways, will be seen as as pariahs on the international seen there'll be very relatively few uh, foreign institutions outside maybe China and, uh, 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 and a, a few other countries that are um, seriously interested in uh, deep collaboration with Russian universities and it's gonna be a very uh, difficult time for them. And one just very final thing, uh, I, I had the honor to meet a number of the rectors of the 5100 institutions during my participation in that commission and um, had great respect for most of them. And then uh, all of them uh, signed this uh, document supporting the war. And I, you know, I, I mean, I don't know any of these people um, personally very well, but it's hard for me to even imagine that they would have signed these documents and sort of brought their universities officially into the Russian government's position on the uh, on the conflict um, uh, voluntarily. So I mean, I, I can't imagine relatively few, if any, have resigned. They all signed it, um, but I'm sure they were not very happy, and I'm sure that's also the case for much of their faculty. But there it is. They're part of the system, and uh, they will suffer the consequences. So thanks for a few comments. And thanks, Phil. And there's a number of points there, Isak, but let's hear from Ellen and then ask you to respond to both discussants and then we'll bring in a couple of people from the Q&A. So, Ellen. Yeah, hi. Um, again, thanks, um, Isak, for your presentation and following on directly from Phil. I guess my comments come, I was a member of the International Advisory Committee to which Phil referred on the Higher School of Economics. I was there since 2016. And um, I was also for a short time um, a member of the advisory committee for the Manuel Kant um, Baltic Federal University in Kaliningrad. And um, mm. that for a much shorter period of time and um, following on from Phil, yes, the HSC advisory committee, we did unanimously resign after a conversation indeed also with Phil and Isaac as well, but um, in, um, in March, and that was a very sad occasion. It is, um, as um, Isaac pointed to, was the increasing modernization um, of Russian higher education and HSE, I think, was really at the pinnacle of that. It um, was formed in the 1990s and has, as well known, it's one of the most internationalized, as Simon mentioned, liberal progressive university, one that began to look like a lot of the kinds of um, academic institutions that we're very familiar with and indeed we've partnered with. It was an active member of, the, of EU activities and of the EUA. And um, that was all really um, an extremely important development. Indeed, the whole um, formation of the International Advisory Committees was precisely that, brought on board a wide range of very internationalized um, leaders um, around the world, um, certainly the HSC one was led by um, a Nobel laureate from Harvard and um, it was a very pre prestigious group. I felt honored to have been invited to be on it. it um, and it did discuss those kinds of issues that Isaac pointed to. I mean, all these issues around global positioning, 
I guess I would refer to the role of higher education and the changes there as a, as a deliberate access uh, role of um, the geopoliticalization of higher education. And that's, I think, where that whole 5100 and, the, and your term, the competitiveness came from. And we did discuss that in terms of the HSC, global positioning and rankings. Rankings were to the fore, and I think was part and parcel of an undercurrent about how things might work um, moving away slightly. There were some concerns about whether it was moving too far away from its base as social science and economics, and as it began to embrace some of the science and technology areas, which clearly in the rankings proved more important. Um, there were also issues around international recruitment that we discussed, uh, faculty promotion criteria. And then there were also these kinds of um, background underpinning tensions to which Phil um, then refers at the end. Um, most notably, I think one of our latter discussions, um, I think you were still there, Phil, um, discussing the um, code of conduct, um, of which there was quite a lot of discussion. You'll remember that as well, Isaac. But some of the key issues that came out concerned always thinking about the university's development and reputation. In other words, how you think about that in terms of what your actions are, political neutrality and discretion in public statements, actively engaging with the public, and liability for failing to comply with the code of conduct. So I would say that over time, we have this very strategic role but there were these underpinning um, and increasingly louder issues around these tensions and problems. Probably less aware was I, I wasn't in the, in the living in Russia, I didn't know, and I am not <clears throat> like Phil, a Russian expert by any means, um, by any means. But it was clear that there were these tensions be, uh, behind the scenes. One statement came out and said, um, HSC is exposed to continuous strong attacks from both the right and the left wings. Actually, both parties try to persuade the university to avoid our principle of political neutrality. There were debates about political reorganization, which you will both um, remember, and hence the non-renewal of contracts, and the fact that some of this also came out in um, both the international press. Um, the issue of a student leader being arrested, and claims about being expelled, um, expelled, sorry, on the basis of orders from above. And more recently then, the sudden replacement of Director um, Kuzumov, who was the founder of the university um, in about a year ago, um, in, certain, in unknown circumstances, as it was explained or not explained to us on the, on the IAC and his re then replacement um, sudden replacement by um, the current um, rector who had come from Vlad Vladivostok. So um, it was a, that kind of um, moving in one direction and yet this undercurrent that was there. And yet we now see where that was going. Thank you. Uh, and thanks, Helen. And there's quite a lot there, Isak, to chew over, but I must in, want, endorse what Phil and Ellen have said about the achievement of building the, the high school of economics, um, where I've also had a connection and um, it really was pretty impressive what building that from the ground up in, in less than 30 years uh, and, uh, and building a strong institute of education as well, Isaac. Uh, Isaac, would you like to respond to Phil and Ellen and then I'll bring in Alan Moore and Ruth Hayhoe. Thank you very much, Simon. Thank you very much, Phil and Ellen. Uh, just a few points, you, you made a great contribution to the overall discussion. On Academy of Sciences, I, I fully agree, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, in fact, the Academy of Sciences is a stakeholder that really presents the uh, uh, idea, not just keeping Soviet status quo, but to develop it further, to develop Academy, the whole idea to merge academy with higher education was uh, strongly opposed by them. And, uh, but they played um, an interesting role, often positive role, and some universities like High School of Economics managed to establish good relationships with them. But indeed, uh, 
because there are two conflicting forces and um, it's it's inevitable result <laughs> if if you you know uh, the newton laws of motion tells us tell us that if you uh, put forces from two opposite sides you would not move <laughs> uh, uh, the very interesting point about university and politics that uh, Ellen mentioned uh, that you feel you felt during the last years indeed but again let's assume that the universities uh, kind of inter uh, internalize their mission to help Russia to become a global leader yeah that's 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 very simple uh, in our understanding of university mission it's something completely different it, it, it it's not what what you what um, ideal university is about but it could be we observe similar things now in china even uh, 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 when we talk about ideological education for example we see much more in china even uh, than in current russia so i guess it, it, again um, if if we uh, admit that such logic could exist, uh, then uh, what happened it uh, looks quite logical. Uh, also, yeah, there are also some ideas for the next seminar. What will happen with the Russian education after February twenty fourth? I'm not going to comment them uh, on that. We'll we'll wait for the next seminar. Uh, Simon, I also uh, looked at one interesting question in the chat. May I respond uh, now? Yeah, what we would like to do is bring in those two people who have put forward things so they can speak in the chat themselves, in the set, in the webinar themselves. So let's do that. Sure. Um, and I, I'm, what I'll do now is because time's running out, I'll, I'll bring in Alan and Ruth together. We'll have them in succession and then Isa can respond to both. So, uh, Alan, please. Alan Moore. Simon, thank you very much. Great to see you again. I know you're a good friend of our, uh, or my, our good colleague, uh, Timothy O'Connor in uh, Missis. So, uh, greetings to everyone from, from Moscow. Um, of course, Isa, terrific presentation. Um, yeah, lots of food for thought and especially the development course with the different countries and, you know, embracing the post-Soviet sphere, superb. Um, I'm not going to comment on, on anything that has happened since well, fe uh, February. Um, it, it's been very disappointing. Of course, I'm head of the international office at uh, the National University of Science, Technology, and Um um But I just ask, uh, I, Itak, is um, the, what I found, because I moved from the Russian State Social University across to Missis, uh, to implement, a, implement uh, an internationalization plan uh, because with the 5100, there was a push to grow enrollment of international students and academic mobility. Now the new project, Priority 2030, uh, the only international students we're interested in are masters and PhD students. Um, however, the whole internationalization aspect seems to have been uh, forgotten because the drive was to recruit students but not to assimilate them or to cater for them or to provide support. Um, I know HSE has done better than most universities in Russia. Um, can I ask Isaac, why was that gap left there? Was it deliberate or was it just because the rush to sort of grow quickly was at the expense of actually providing the environment for international students to come into? Now hold that thought, Isaac, because we'll bring in Ruth as well at this point, and then you'll have two questions to answer. Ruth. Yes, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. And thank you, Professor Fruman, for truly an engaging and illuminating uh, overview of the recent uh, decades. I want to ask you about China, both contemporary, what's going on between Russian and Chinese education, but also I can't help but think of history, and I want to get your thoughts about this. I studied the 50s and 60s very closely in China, and I saw the Cultural Revolution on a cultural level as a reaction to what the Chinese defined as Soviet socialist imperialism, and exactly the system you described, narrow specialization, top-down control, um, macro planning, all things that really didn't fit with Chinese culture at that time. And I think that's the reason Mao was able to 
some years later, after sending the Soviet experts home, initiate a cultural revolution, which was, of course, mainly a political battle. I definitely recognize that. But there were underlying cultural elements, which I think have been given very little attention in the overview of China's higher education development. So I'd just love to hear a few words from you, both on the contemporary and also on the reflection on that period of Soviet-Chinese cooperation in the 1950s. Thank you. Well, isn't that interesting? And your uh, angle on the Cultural Revolution. Isaac, uh, Alan, and Ruth have given you some something to work with there. Um, Isaac, over to you. you very, yeah, thank you very much. Um, very interesting questions. Uh, uh, Alan, uh, I have, uh, you know, after I thought about this kind of new framework, uh, probably I can uh, respond to your question now, at, at least, uh, uh, you know, I see some logic in what you described, that uh, there, there is no internationalization in terms of diversity, in terms of multi perspectives, there is isn't internationalization in terms of bringing people in and uh, use it as a soft power, use it to engage them uh, into this, in kind of in the area of influence of, of the global leader. Again, I think it's very logical. And frankly speaking, when I, uh, I was an advisor for, Minister Livanov, I told him that um, Russia has to do more with uh, elites uh, uh, in developing countries, bring their kids to Russia for free, educate them, etc. So if you think from this perspective, you find it very logical. You don't, if you think from the perspective of uh, pragmatic uh, uh, modernization. You would think that you have to use these international students and international faculty to make diverse environments, to make multicultural uh, competent, to develop multicultural competence. But that was done from the different logic. I, I think. Now I, I interpret it. And the last thing, uh, and the second question was really uh, close to my heart because I, I do remember my visit to Renmin University in Beijing. And, Ren, and I saw their dining room, which is called Moskva, or Moscow. <laughs> because Renmin University was established with the support of um, Russian Economic University, uh, Plekhanov's uh, University. And uh, I can tell you, Ruth, that um, I don't know. In fact, my answer is that I don't know the answer. Uh, how it happened that after the end of the Cultural Revolution, Soviets didn't come back uh, to China into the higher education because there are, there are even still some professors that uh, were educated in the Soviet. Mm -hmm. that's, that's an interesting question, but definitely again, it tells us a lot about the nature of higher education in Soviet Union, which had this messian mission uh, to promote socialist ideas around the world. And it's part of the identity. Well, uh, we have reached the end of our time. Um, I really want to sincerely thank uh, everyone who's spoken, all five people. It's been a privilege to, to chair this, this webinar. Um, deep thanks to ESAC for such a strong presentation and responses to the questions. Uh, lots of positive comments coming through in the chat, ESAC. Thanks to Phil and, and Alan for adding a lot to the discussion in, in, in short time each. And uh, thank you to Alan and Ruth for your quick, excellent questions. Uh, and thank you everyone for coming. Um, I've tuned in for part two uh, of Higher Education in Russia. We're focusing on events since the invasion of Ukraine um, or the situation in higher education in Russia since then. And that'll be on the 23rd of June. Now, Trevor has advertised 
forthcoming events in the chat already, let me um, underline the CG conference that starts on the 24th of May uh, and, and finishes on the 25th. It's like a succession of, uh, of webinars with some pause between each one. We've got terrific sessions and great panel sessions with the international speakers and all of the CG projects will be presented as well. Four major keynotes. Uh, and uh, we've already achieved, I noticed this morning, 1,000 registrations. So we're looking forward to a monster CG conference with plenty of opportunities to, for, to intervene uh, through the Q&A function. All of the sessions will have a Q&A component, providing our speakers keep to their time. So we look forward to seeing you then. We also look forward to seeing you uh, next, uh, next Thursday in two days' time for Ying Yi Ma, who's going to talk about America and Chinese students. She's going to talk about Chinese students, uh, how they succeed and struggle in American higher education, which will give us another angle on the Chinese students go abroad topic, which, uh, which exercises us quite often in these webinars. But it'll be interesting to see, us, see, see the inside of the United States at the moment. Um, another country very much in the news since the Roe versus Wade decision. Uh, so thanks again to everyone, but a special thanks to Isaac for giving us such a masterly presentation today. Bye for now. <laughs>